So when uh, my wife and I were quite young and had a couple really small kids, we got into the RV industry, bought a tent trailer. And uh, we used to like to come drop down. We lived up in the Seattle area and drop down and go up the river to uh, campground not too far from uh, Hood River. And first time we went out, threw up the tent trailer, opened it up, and that night, about 11 o'clock, Mama and her three-year-old daughter had to go to the bathroom. So um, at this little state campground by the, uh, the river, there's a nice paved walk up to the restrooms and a, and a big light at the end of the restrooms. And so anyway, she and my daughter got up, and it was pretty dark, but they were just headed towards that light. And they came back, and everything was fine. They said, there's a great big rock in the walkway, and we had to walk around this rock. So, okay, no problem. Next morning, they got up and had to go potty again. My wife came back, just freaked. Rock wasn't there anymore. And I said, oh, that was a bear. So we immediately got rid of the tent trailer and went to a pickup camper, which was safer, but it had its own toilet. So they didn't have to get up anymore. So that was our first experience. Welcome to Guarantee RV, our monthly seminars. My name is Dan Edgecombe. I'm part-time weekend guy. This is Dave Taylor. He is our service manager, the guy. Good morning. Can everybody hear us okay? Daryl's. Daryl's our sound expert, and we're not sure he's got this quite dialed in yet. I, I apparently. Sounds good. It, everybody obviously can hear. So these, uh, these forums that we present, these seminars, they are here for your information. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're here to answer your questions. Between the two of us, we've got about 70 years of experience and we're here to share that with you this time we're doing accessories which is pretty much me next time is rv basics which is the big one we do it every other month second saturday of the month so please ask questions we have a rough outline this one usually doesn't take too long but ask questions this is we're here for you If we don't cover something today and you do have a question, we'll probably have more than enough time to answer it for you. Uh, yes, sir, you in the back. Yes, what do you recommend for accessories that help make the, each trip more enjoyable? Well, hang around for about the next hour and a half. You're going to find out. That's a good question, though. <laughs> um, so, are you, are you leaving? He's here, man. <laughs> okay. No, just not going to sit here. I'm going to stand up and watch okay. you do your magic. So, um, that question is from one of our top salesmen. Yeah, you, coach. <laughs> so, anyway, I'd like to start this morning a little bit off center. Uh, when we're done, we're going to break into some of the conspiracy theories that we're, we're having fun with. But in the meantime, uh, this gentleman right here, uh, you own a motorhome? Uh, fifth wheel. Fifth wheel. All right. Congratulations. His question was about, are we going to do these kind of thingies in the boxes? Yes, we are. Uh, this is a surge protector. Dave and I have worked together for many years in different buildings. I only worked for him for, I don't know, maybe a year, long time ago. He, we always don't always see eye to eye, and this is one of the things that we don't always agree with. Surge protectors are akin to gamblers. When you pull into a campground, there is a chance that some drunk will hit a telephone pole and smash the electrical, and you've got 11,000 volts going up the, the cord to your coach and fries everything in the coach. But that's just a small chance. About two or three times a year, I, I see 
coaches come in where all their electrical is fried and the people pay their deductible from their collision comprehensive insurance and everything is replaced. So for years, my contention was it's, it's, a, it's a gambler's choice. You pay 500 or 400 or $600, depending on what you get, for a surge protector, and it will, a good one will protect your coach. The way these work is they're a fuse, and they are designed while those milliseconds where the 10,000 volts are coming through the power line, this absorbs for the few, first few milliseconds all of the current. While it's absorbing that current, it's melting down. The reason it's absorbing is we don't want any of that 10,000 volts going into the coach. So the good ones, they're all ra rated in, in joules, which is like a gallon of water. A joule is a volume of electricity. They can hold so much volume of this electricity while they're melting down. Every one of these is rated and this one's rated in 3,850 joules. And that is pretty stinking high. That's a lot of capacity to, for it to absorb. This little cheap piece of junk um, has, uh, like, looks like uh, 4,200 joules, which is not very much. What you're buying is the joules. If you have a good one, and this one's a hardwired, and it is rated at 3,800, uh, it is good enough to absorb all the current before it melts, while it's melting down. These cheap ones, if you had one of these, you plug it in, it gets fried. Unfortunately, three quarters of the current that it's trying to protect you from while it's melting down, slips through and destroys the microwave, the air conditioner, and the TV. So if you're going to buy a surge protector, whether it's a hard wire or a plug-in one, always buy the biggest capacity one you can get. Yes, sir? Is that a one and done? Or yes. Is it, so once it, once it happens, is there an indication that it has happened? Have you ever seen something a com electrical component gets so hot that it melted and it was like a, a piece of charcoal with two pieces of wire sticking out of it. That's what these look like. The manufacturer says save the box for at least the first year. If it fails, melts down and during the first year, put it back in the box, send it back to us. If you don't have the box, don't bother. They must have the box. And then they will either replace or repair at their discretion. So, the, <clears throat> excuse me. So, if that happens, is it a repairable item, or do you that, that you can repair in in your rig? No. Okay. So, if you have a hard wire, and you meet with this, uh, your buddy comes over and wires your coach to 220 in your house and lights the whole thing up. Uh, this thing will fry, and then you have to take it out put it in the box and then install the new one. I've always looked at it like, well, it, this thing costs four or five hundred bucks. Your deductible costs four or five hundred bucks. What's the point? Somebody's going to just steal it anyway. Dave. Waiting for him to turn me up. Apparently they have turned me down every time. I don't know. So this is my theory. How many people I've seen come in the second day of their two-week or four-week trip, and I have to look them in the eye and say, yeah, we've got about 4000 bucks worth of repairs to do, and if you leave it here, we'll have it done sometime in the next two to four weeks. And instantly their trip is done. It never happens in your driveway when you're plugged in to charge your battery. It always happens when you're on a trip. And if you've planned that trip all year long, let this $500 keep you on your trip. If you come in with one of these fried, I can have you up and running the same day. I run down here, get it. Four hours later, you're in the shop, it's in. 
By 5 o'clock, you're over in the campground. Next morning after your coffee, you're back on your trip. You missed a day. Once, the, once electricity hits your unit like that, or the lack of electricity, brownouts are just as bad. They will take out air conditioners, refrigerators. Your 12-volt boards on your furnaces, water heaters, just smoked them. And fortunately, if that's all it takes out, you're okay. So I've seen it actually back feed in through the wires and burn wires and walls. And uh, so that's why I like to have one, and I do have one. It's a gamble, but it's not just a gamble for money. It's a gamble for your trip. Yes? What is what is the wattage it'll take, or what? Well, when you come to buy one, our service writer will get with you and ask you what kind of a unit you have. And there's going to be 30 amp and 50 amp. And like he says, the, some of these built-in ones are not inexpensive. But it's peace of mind is what you're buying. Can you, can you give us any kind of a ballpark figure on what it costs? Not the cost of the item, but the cost of having it installed. Installation cost on one of these greatly depends on where we have room to put it in. On a fifth wheel, you, we can usually do it in uh, an hour and a half to two hours. Most motorhomes, an hour and a half to two hours. But if it plugs in here and your transfer switch is there, sometimes it can be three or four hours. Yeah, hour and a half to two hours is usually what we charge. You said they want to do it, go up to the cheap. Is there a good plug in there? Oh, yeah. We have... Uh, uh, right here, we have the same thing as this in in the corded portable. Uh, I just hate these. Uh, I just they're a waste of time. It's. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I I do not like the cheap one. This is all the same stuff. So those are good. I just was displaying that one. But yeah, we have the same in the 30 and the 50. And they all display the jewels, so you just look at how many jewels and pick the biggest one, and 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 that's what it is. Uh, we at at Guarantee, one thing we do when we sell this kind of an item, an installation item, we call it a menu item. We only charge a hundred dollars an hour. Our posted labor rate's 130. But if you were to buy any kind of an accessory, we do it at an internal uh, accessory price of $100 an hour. So his pricing was $150 to $200, bucks, depending on, and it might even be less than that. It's, it's it pretty much whatever it takes. I've got another question, and probably if the salesman is here, you won't be able to answer. But do you have a preference over the progressive industry versus the... Uh I, I think that any of the best techs that we have, and we've got a lot of really good ones, they all go for progressive dynamics. Sometimes a service rider will try to slip in one of the other ones, and they tend to push back. Progressive dynamics, a little bit better product. Good company. That is that, that's the progressive industry? Um, <laughs> we don't display the progressive dynamics. They're a little bit more money. Not much, but they, they, they're in the same kind of box. But okay. I, I, we, we stock them in the back room. It, it's, I don't know why they don't put them up there. Okay. Anyway. So anyway, um, I just want to, one last thing before we end this is a, a couple of years ago, I kind of conceded to Dave on this one item, and they got it on video. Uh, don't do that too often, but I agree. Before, I used to be adamant, don't bother, but yeah, I can see his point. That hurt. Your Thanks. turn. <laughs> what do you want to talk about now? You want to go into your happy camper or you want me to... You wanna, why don't you do your batteries? Okay. You're good at it. In the uh, RV Basics, uh, we talk about batteries quite extensively because the batteries are the heart of your RV. Whether you have a tent trailer, a pickup camper, fifth wheel, a motor home, um, they all function, the house side always functions, whether it's an all-electric coach 
or a gas coach, meaning propane. Uh, they all function off of a 12 volt electrical system and they're all driven by They're all driven, she's the uh, head lady at the Chevy garage. Anyway, um, they're all driven by 12 volt or batteries, 12 volt electrical systems. So batteries are very important. There are several types. The most common type is the 12 volt deep cycle. This is a, what they call a wet cell or a flooded cell battery. It has lead plates six cells, 2.1 volts per cell, and then it's flooded with sulfuric acid. The chemical reaction is lead sulfuric acid combining to make lead sulfate water and electrons. And that's how we get our electricity out of these things. When the lead and the sulfuric acid combine, that's, they give off electrons. When we are charging the battery, you start your engine, the alternator comes on, voltage goes up. What we are doing now is electroplating the lead back onto the plate. We're reversing that. We're, we're using electricity to force the chemical reaction from lead sulfate back to lead and sulfuric acid. In a deep cycling battery, they have fewer plates, but they're kind of chubby like me. And the reason for that is they are designed to be able to discharge or deplate. The lead can go into solution quite a bit longer because of the way the plates are built. They don't have as many plates, but they're large, heavy plates, so you can discharge them over a long period of time and then recharge them without causing battery damage. A starting battery rated in cold cranking amps is exactly the opposite. It has a lot of very thin plates, high surface area, so that there's a lot more opportunity for the lead and the sulfuric acid to react with each other and they can discharge a large amount of current over a short period of time and they recharge just as fast. Deep cycles are long, slow. If you try to use a starting battery as a deep cycling battery, the problem is you discharge it to the point where typically after two or three or four times, there isn't enough lead back on that plate to actually necessitate the replating. So the plate, the lead can't replate, it can't recharge and the deep side the, the, the starting battery fails so you need to make sure that if you need to replace your battery you always get a deep cycle battery now, <coughs> those require some maintenance in keeping the water level up. the question this young man has is they require some maintenance yes they do and do you use distilled water the question is do we use distilled water yes Go to Walmart or Bymart or wherever and buy a gallon of distilled water. It's cheap. It's a buck. It, that's the you know. There's there's several different styles of, of flooded cell batteries, and the most popular is the six volt deep cycle, where they call it a golf cart battery because that industry uses them heavily. They're a taller battery because they have a sediment bowl in the bottom of each cell because if you grew up on a farm and you've got some well water and it tastes great, looks beautiful, but it still has particulate in it. And in this chemical reaction, when you put a lot of current in the battery to charge it, all of that extra chemical is forced to settle out. So you get mud in the bottom of this. So the cleaner the water, the better. And this mud in the bottom will short out that cell if you just use crappy water. So it's very important to use very clean water. And Dave will tell you about the maintenance aspects. Uh, the, the last one I want to talk about is an absorbed glass mat AGM battery. Absorbed glass mat batteries, basically there's a fiberglass pouch 
They put a lead plate in it and they impregnate it with a gelled electrolyte. So it's, it's like sulfuric acid and jello. Instead of orange jello, you've got sulfuric acid jello, and they impregnate it in that, shove the plates together. They're, it's the same chemical reaction, but there's nowhere for the outgassing. It just is held right there in solution. So these batteries are sealed. They operate just as well on their side or upside down as if they're upright. They don't take any maintenance other than cleaning the top. Uh, they're a little bit slower to charge, a little bit harder to chi charge, they take a little more potential. But the nice thing is, is they will deep discharge at least twice as often as a flooded cell. So the duty cycles where they discharge, recharge, this could be 380 to 600 depending on the battery. And on a flooded cell, it could be 180, 200. So where these are twice as much money, they, they last two to three times as long. The other thing is that some people, all they do is maintain their martini mixture. My wife's good at that. She's got a certain mixture she likes. Other people like to mess with their RV, and they like to piddle with everything, and they, they enjoy checking their water levels and that that's a rare person but it does happen so if you don't like messing with things the AGMs are better they're also better because they're a tougher battery if you're running an inverter or anything like that they will stand up much better now Dave's going to tell you how to maintain them and give you his thoughts and experience and wisdom price difference between the 6 volt AGM and a 6 volt lead acid just so nobody runs down and thinks we're just going to swap them out battery for battery the, the the 12 volt flooded cell is 100 bucks i believe is what six we get 6 volt is how much is 150 and how much is the 6 volt to that i think it's it's like uh, 360 bucks now so it's an upgrade item it does cost quite a bit more but again, you don't ever have to mess with it. I've had, I've had them in my fifth wheel for about three years. Ever since I got tired of checking the water level. As far as maintenance, usually we do most of our maintenance tips on our RV, what's it called now? Basics. RV Basics. It's going to take me a little bit to get used to calling it something different. We've called it something else for ten years. The main thing is water level and keep the tops clean. There are par parasitic draws that can occur between the positive and negative side of the battery. If they're dirty on top, amperage will flow through dirt and moisture and so. We store our RV um, in covered storage, but we don't have any uh, electricity there. Mm -hmm. His question is, his question is storage when you can't leave it plugged in. This is also a, one of those things that Dan and I agree with, or di agree and disagree with. So if you're going to store your unit, you can't plug it in, especially in the winter, and you're not going to take the batteries out, you want to start with a full charge. Because a discharged battery is basically just water. And a discharged battery, if it freezes outside, your battery's going to freeze and it's going to split. So if you start with a fully charged battery, you put it in your storage unit for two months, not plugged in, you are going to have battery issues. So it's good to pull them out as long as you're that guy that can. We have people all the time pull their batteries out, six months later go to put them in, forgot how they were to go in, and then call me and expect us to drive to Medford to reinstall their batteries. So that's an issue. Taking them out's not an issue. The best thing to do is charge it completely. Let us install a battery disconnect. It's got one in it. Okay. 
Okay, depending on the model, your battery disconnect may not be a complete battery disconnect. Because if it's chassis battery and you have a chassis disconnect, it's going to disconnect most of the stuff. You're going to still have transmission memories, engine memories, stuff that is wired past that. In a, in a fifth wheel or trailer, when you take that battery out with a disconnect, you basically have taken that battery state of charge and stopped the discharge. If you're just going to leave it for two months, that battery you're going to come back is going to look just about the way it was when you put it in there. If we put a disconnect in at the battery, not at a relay downstream, then we're going to disconnect everything. So theoretically, you could leave it for two months, not have to take it out and recharge it. But taking them out is not a problem as long as you remember how to put them in. Because everybody thinks they're going to. And four months later, they forgot, was the red wire, the black wire? Well, Years ago, it used to be white, white and red or black and red. Now we have red, black, and white. And unless you know what color is what, some red is usually always hot. But now we have black and white thrown in there. Sometimes black is hot, sometimes it's negative. And it only takes hooking it up wrong to run these reverse polarity, and they get real hot real fast. Well, I just put cable ties on them. Um, yeah. Them together and put cable tie on them, so I can... Yeah, so you can take them out and charge them. But you should be able to store those batteries for two months and not lose charge if we get them disconnected right. Okay. So can I ask you a question? Uh, cover that you uh, put it in, is that something you own? No. Oh, okay. And the reason I was asking that is you could hang a solar panel on the side of it and, you know, and, and plug that in. Right. I, I have a solar panel on the rig, but I'm, you know it's under the cover. Yeah. And it's it's the front of it's got a northern exposure, so even if I put a portable one there, I don't get, don't get yeah. light. Yeah. Well, and portable one gets stolen. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You want to talk happy camper, or do you want me to go into yeah. solar? Okay. Yeah, let's talk a little. We're just running down, down through here. Happy camper. <laughs> I know you guys have heard. Most of you have heard about this stuff. It's made in Oregon. Uh, if you go up to our main service or even our service down here and look on every bench, you're going to find tubs and tubs of this. Because believe it or not, we do a lot of work on stuff containing poop. And if you use this, it's going to eliminate the smell and it's going to keep your probes cleaner. Everybody out here that has an RV is going to have probe problems eventually. You can say you're not. I don't care how vigilant you are. Eventually, you're going to have a probe that's hung up with something on it. This stuff's your best bet. I don't guarantee it 100% because probes are probes. But if you use this, every time you dump your tank, preload your tank with it, and those of you who have been here before know that we say to put a scoop or two of this in five gallons of water, three to five, depending on your rig. If you have a a uh, road trek that only has a seven gallon black tank, you don't want to put five gallons of water in it. You're going to want to mix this, put it down your tank, and let it sit in the bottom. That way every time you go in there and go to the restroom, you already have this in there eating the waste. It will eat the waste. You could, we've tested it. The main thing is we get people say every time I flush I get a, a smell back up through the toilet. This is the best stuff we've found to get rid of that smell. Toilets and RVs do not have pee traps. So every time you put your foot on it and flush, you're basically an open tube right down to what we know it is. So it's not a pretty thing. When our guys have to work on tanks, believe it or not, they know what's in there. So we usually flush them out with this, put a little in there, even a little dry in there at the end. When they're taking the toilet off or the black tank out, you can't even smell it in the shop. It does work. There are other brands that 15 years ago, I'd have told you a different brand was the best, and it was back then. Now this is it. Uh, you're starting to see it more and more nationwide. It started on the West Coast because, like I say, it's made in Oregon. It was Medford or Grants Pass. Um, it's just great stuff. Now, if you have... 
if you're taking any antibiotics, then it does kill this. The antibiotics will kill what's in here. If you're on cancer drugs, it can kill what's in here. So don't use this if you're on that. If you're using antibacterial shampoo, hand soap, whatever, antibacterial kills this bacteria. So if you insist on using antibacterial, which that gets us right back into, I don't believe, I think we're all too bacteria. We, it's okay to have a little on you. We, they actually make this for people on cancer or that have cancer on cancer drugs and that insist on using antibacterial that still works, does not work as well, but they give you the option. So it's out there. Like I say, if you go out in the shop, you won't find any other brand on a workbench but this right here. And there's a reason for that. Any more questions on poop tanks? See, I get really into this on our new, what is it? What are we called again? Basics. RV Basics. That's all you need if you're setting it. Nothing else. When I've heard all sorts of... I used it last year and I never had a smell at all. Yeah. I've heard, depending on what campfire you're sitting around and what campground, every old timer there is going to have a better something. I've heard dishwashing detergent and this. We even worked on a guy's tank that let his buddy talk him into putting three-quarter minus gravel in his black tank and told him that if he'd put a couple shovelfuls of gravel in there and drive really fast around corners, it would sand the inside of his... It did a great job. We just never get it all out. So... That guy's still laughing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes campfires are great and stories are great, but we all know that sometimes... People start drinking and coming up with ideas. They're not always great. So, RV basics. I'm going to have to practice that all day. Okay, what are we talking about next? I'm going into LED bulbs. You don't get these. LED bulbs. If you dry camp a great bunch, a great bunch. Is that an actual? I think so. LED bulbs. They have a bulb or a new light or a replacement for any light out there now. They're wonderful if they're purchased right. Uh, when these got real popular here, I want to say last year, but I'll bet you it's been five years now. The older you get, time goes faster. I went down, I got a 36 foot fifth wheel. I went down and bought about 40 bulbs to change every one out in my fifth wheel. I walked up and I bought the, uh, what's this one called? Soft white. I didn't know there was a difference. LEDs, LED. I went up and grabbed a whole bunch of these bright white LEDs, went in my fifth wheel, changed everything out, started flipping on lights, and we walked around for a week in sunglasses. Too bright. If, if you have a little restroom with a door and you want a bright one in there, great. Maybe your reading light over your head in bed. Buy one of each. There's about three different, there's soft white, low light, bright white. See what light works best in your unit. Because it, it can look like a discotheque. So, and back then these bulbs were $12, $14 a piece when I was buying them. So I, I returned, they wouldn't let me return. I came down and bought another three or 400 bucks worth of soft white and replaced them and they're great. Even if you're a full-timer in a park where you're paying, paying electrical, all those lights you're running are causing your converter, which charges your batteries, to cycle more. You're going to save just on electrical in a park. But if you like to go dry camping, this is the difference between one night with batteries or two nights with batteries. Without solar, you're not going to get more than that. So LEDs are great. Even the thin lights, everybody has the old thin lights up in the ceilings with two long bulbs. They have replacements for those now. They're stick-ins. We actually take your light, cut the bulbs, all the wires out, put the stick-ins in, wire it. It takes us about a half hour of light. They're great. Any quick? Whoa, you got a question? No, no, no. I just, uh, you had 
skipped over the heat issue. Uh, these don't generate nearly as much heat as the incandescents. Maybe I didn't skip over it. Maybe I hadn't just got there yet. Oh, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> No, I skipped over it. I just didn't want to admit it to him. Yes, heat. It's okay. <laughs> Can't say no heat. You'll feel a little bit. But uh, it's definitely a different light. Now, <clears throat> just because I'm totally honest, I love these things. But I've been noticing lately they're doing like anything. This doctor will tell you to eat 50 apples a day, and then a year later you find out if you eat more than two, you're going to die. I've been seeing research that shows if you change all your lights out to LED, it messes with your sleep cycles. It's not the same light. Your brain doesn't see it the same. So mix. Have some. Put one of these in your light with a regular or possibly these with an LED, these over here with a regular. So you're getting some incandescent light. Your brain is used to it. So just throwing it out there. It could be another conspiracy. <laughs> like the fluorescent. GE, maybe GE's doing that so they don't have to quit making bulbs. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Any more questions on LEDs, how they work, what they stand, what it stands for, why you need them? I don't want you leaving with any questions. Okay. Max Air vent covers. Does everybody's unit have a vent in it? Where you crank it up? We sell these covers. <coughs> Different styles, types, colors, shapes. You can get them with an extra fan in the front. Whatever you want, we can get for you. The main purpose for this is so that in Oregon, when it's 70 degrees out and you want a little air in your restroom, you're not sitting on the toilet getting rain on your shoulders. You can open your vent, have this over the top, still get air movement, and stay dry. That's the main reason for these. It's just to let air in and not water. I wish I could have got way a lot deeper into that, but <laughs> that's all there is. That's all there is. Um, there's a lot of states like Oregon that, like here, will be raining until June, early part of July. It'll be 70, 65, 70 degrees out. You want the fresh air, but it's still raining. Yeah. Can I interrupt it one more time? Sure. <laughs> I just noticed that, so I'm going to... Yeah. So anyway, um, a little technical fact here. This is made by the people who make fantastic vents, and fantastic vents are fantastic. They didn't like the way Max Air was building their vents, so they built their own. And then they said, look, ours will handle like 1,400 cubic feet per minute of air, where the Max Air 1 will handle about 700 cubic feet of air per minute, and the Max Air 2 will handle about 1,100 cubic feet of air per minute. So theirs is by far the most re least restrictive, but by far the most expensive. So when you go buy vent covers, just a little trivia, the more expensive they are, the less restrictive they are. And some people want the best, well that's this one, because it absolutely, it, it is designed to fit the Max Air vent lids like a glove. They're non-restrictive in the airflow, but a lot of money. We get like, I don't know, about 40 bucks for a Max Air, 50 bucks for a Max Air 2, and 80 for this. Okay, so much for that. Yeah. <laughs> Underneath that, if you can stand in your motorhome and tell the difference between 11 and 1400 feet per minute, <laughs> let me know because I can't. I have Max Air 2s. But they are, they are nice, they're a little thicker. Okay. You done following me up? I'm fine with that. Everybody know what a slide topper is? Goes over your slide room. Do we know? Do we know why it's there? Well, it keeps the rain out of our slide room. No, it doesn't. 
It was never engineered to be a, a leak stop, and it was never engineered for rain. It's always been engineered for pine cones, squirrel poop, bird poop, pine cones, anything else that's going to fall on the top of that slide room. I get people in all year long. My slide room's leaking. Let's just put an extra long slide topper on it. Nope. It's not what it's for. If you're that unit should be dry without a slide topper at all. We need to fix that. And then if you still want a slide topper, I'll be more than happy to sell you one. So that's what they're for. Not a lot to slide top. That's why I say this, uh, this seminar, next year we're going to do something different, this first seminar. Any more questions on slide tappers? Slide tappers? Slide toppers. I didn't even have a drink this morning. Yet. Yeah. What's that? We're try I'm trying to get together with uh, the guy that helps on these, not the sound guy, because he does an excellent job. He needs no help at all. And we're going to try to do a, dig a video walkthrough. We're going to try to do one on a, a towable and one on a motorized. One we can actually sit here and watch and stop and discuss. Basically a walkthrough on a complete unit, outside and inside. Opening bays, how to start ovens. Uh, so we're working on it. We tried to work on it this year and it just got way too busy and we couldn't quite get the thought onto paper and make it happen. But he's assured me he's on it. That's Quinn. I'll say his name so he sees it on, yeah. So we're gonna make this happen. And if it's good, we may even slip that in in the middle of the year. Good idea. So, great. Somebody said good idea. We got one up here. Slide top or uh, trays and you're done. Slide trays. Not popular anymore. Slide trays. <laughs> 10, 10, 20 years ago, everybody wanted a slide tray to put in the side of their, you know, if you got a $300,000 bus, $100,000 bus, you got that two bays that are four by eight. It was real popular to get slide trays to pull in and out. They are neat, but you're going to lose 25% of your room in that bay because when we put it in, you're going to lose the side of the, there's about that much on each side of the slider. It comes up off the bottom of the floor. You lose a ton of space, but it is nice to be able to grab the handle, slide it open, and have your 12 racks of Coca-Cola sitting right there on the end. Um, you can get, if you have a Class A and you want to install a set of AGM batteries because you're going to get a bunch of solar, usually they give you enough room to put two Group 12s or a couple 6s in. We can put in a battery tray, a uh, 36 by 36 heavy duty tray in a bay. And we can stack a bunch of these in on that. So there's uses for it, but not as popular as they once were. Sorry, I know you've been trying to sell them, but isn't that pretty much a true statement? Yes, I agree with you 100%. Slide trays are occasionally a necessary evil, but uh, yeah. It, they're on the list. We agree on That's first thing in 10 years. Now, this is... Back, nice. What's that? If you don't have bad you, back, exactly. Yeah, if you don't... But you do. You lose a lot of space. Yeah. If you're smart about it, you can use that empty space, put some brackets in, hang, hang your shovel and your rake and your fishing poles. But you'll lose a pretty good chunk. If you want to put an outside freezer, fridge freezer, so when you go up and catch halibut and you stop by and bring me some, you notice I said bring me some if you go to catch halibut, they make a little freezer slide you can put in and out. There is a place for them. They're just not as pod. We used to put in two or three a day. Now, it's just not as much, especially with side swing compartments now. Side swing compartments, you're not, you're not having to get down on your hands and knees before you get close enough to the, to the unit to, to get to it. So I'm going to let him take off now on solar panels. You'll just notice what I did. This one must be sitting out here on the floor or something. Yeah, that is our floor display portable. Thank you, Dave. He was uh, 
good enough to point out that there's a bunch of dust on those solar panels. Solar panels, in my opinion, are the neatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, solar, it's a little bit of money to get into it, but once you buy a panel, they come with a 20-year warranty. Uh, you can take them off one coach, put them on the next because they're going to last. We use Zamp Solar only because it's made in Oregon and it's really good stuff. They actually build the 160 watt panel in Bend, Oregon. Uh, the new panels, the, the way panels work is they, if you were in grade school and you had a science teacher, he got a bimetallic strip out and he heated it and it looked like a butter knife, but when he heated it, it would bend because the coefficient of expansion of one of the metals was different than the other metal. So this bimetallic strip would bend. And when it bends, the two metals are bonded together and they create a resistance. And it's that resistance that the solar panels use to generate current. Now, how they do it, I've never gotten into that, but that's how they work. Uh, they're very efficient. They're very strong. When I was, I used to do a lot of uh, seminars and things at the rallies, and I worked for years next to the solar panel guy. Guy not quite my size. He back then we had 100 watt panels. He would open one up, flop it down on the concrete, and he would stand on that thing all day long. Solar panels are very durable. They don't like being twisted or flexed. So if you have a large portable solar panel, one of the times when you take it out and you go like this, it'll go pink. It's worthless. It's dead. So the permanently mounted solar panels are pretty much all we do because they just don't like being messed with. They're tough. They're very durable, but they don't like being messed with. The other thing is, is it's very interesting. If this were working and I put my hand over it like this, that shadowing would shut it down. So when you park in a campsite and there's a tree branch two feet above the solar panel, forget it, it won't work. You've got to have five to 10 feet with no shading. If, it, if you see shade, it's not going to work. If it's 10 feet away and there's no real obvious shading, it'll probably work just fine and the charge control panel will show you what the current is so you can tell if you're okay. It's just an idiosyncrasy of a solar panel. Solar panels are battery chargers, pure and simple, straight up, straight down, that's all they do. If you are wanting to dry camp or to store it somewhere where you want to maintain the batteries and it's not covered, solar is the best answer. Uh, if you want to, let's say that you need a CPAP machine at night. The same company builds a very nice inverter uh, designed especially, especially for CPAPs. You install a solar panel, put that CPAP inverter in there. Now you don't have to buy a $1,000 generator, Honda or Yamaha from us or whoever, Al-Qaeda, and nobody's going to steal it. The solar panel will maintain the batteries. The inverter charges, takes power from the batteries and makes 110 to operate your CPAP. It's a very, very simple, efficient $2,000 expense. But once you do that, it's there, and the solar panels the last 20, 25, 30 years. Uh, and, and once the initial investment is over, it's free. And we can move that up or down the scale, and I've done this forever, and it, it, I tell people it's a very personal thing. Each person has their own needs, they have their own coach, and we need to see what they want, what they need, and what will fit on their coach. So it's difficult to generically say, oh yeah, it's this much money, it's, it doesn't work that way. But solar panel systems start out fairly basic and go all the way up. Uh, we do big, expensive, all electric diesel pushers and we've done six, nine panels. And uh, a lot of, uh, several big inverters, two to three big inverters, and it's, that's a lot of money. And some of our big high ends, they come with 16 of these, huge. So we can go from one end to the other. We have portables, uh, high theft, but they work well if you're conscientious about it. You just set them out, run the cord over, and clamp it to the battery, 
Yes. Is there any maintenance to the solar panel? Well, I started to say Dave wrote his name in that panel. They, this, this whole reflectivity issue with my arm, and then I forgot. The whole point is, is this one old guy lives in Alaska, and he came down, he wanted a solar panel, he put it on. He came back a year later screaming and hollering because it didn't work. Tech got up and looked at it, wrote his name in it, took a picture of it, cleaned it off, they worked great. So you do have to clean them. Mild soap and water a couple times a year, keep the industrial fallout or the pollution off of it. Keep the panel clean. Don't put Windex on it because those brighteners in Windex reflect. We learned all of that from the old dome satellites. We used to put Windex and this and that on there and then they'd quit working because the chemicals in these cleaners to make it look sparkly and nice would reflect the, the signal and the, and the satellite dish would become defunct. So that transferred over into solar. So mild soap and water and that's it. But you do have to clean them a couple times a year. So uh, the basic on solar panels is just a battery charger. And the newer ones are much more efficient because there's three primary colors, red, blue, and green. Red is heat, and that doesn't work on these. Blue and green used to be just blue. Uh, in the beginning, they could only make a solar panel that reacted to blue light. Now, the newer ones, like the 160-watt ZAMP, uh, they, re they deal in blue and green, so they're about 75% more efficient than the old panel. So the newer stuff, like the 160-watt ZAMP, and you have to be careful. I know that those people out on the highway over there, they sell everything made out of China. And you have to be careful because it, it's, it's very misleading how they uh, rate solar panels. And like our 160 watt solar panel, what the heck does that mean? I, I'm educated in engineering and I'd have a tough time explaining to you how they come up with that 160 watt. What we look at is how many amps it puts out at maximum charge. And it's you, you have to look at that rating if you're going and dealing with another RV in this, uh, dealer somewhere and they're trying to sell you something, look at what the hourly charge rate is. That's the only thing you really care about. The ones that we deal with are about eight and a half amps per hour. And what that means is if you're out on a day like today, it's kind of crappy, but not too bad. They're about 50% efficient. In a bright sunny day, it would be, they would be putting eight, eight and a half amps into the battery per hour on a day like today, maybe four. Uh, some of the other brands made in China that are only operating on one color, they may be five or six amp hour rating, putting out on a day like today, two or three. So you have to be very careful. Questions? Okay, everybody's gone to sleep. Okay, the last thing. Oh. So you're anchoring that on top of an RV? Yes. So okay. when I clean it, do I take it off? Do I ever take it off? Once you anchor it if you're my brother, I'd beat the crap out of you if you did that. They're permanent. You, okay. All you do is. Once they're there, they're there. Yes. If, if you were like. Gotcha. <laughs> what? They are. Now removable. Did you see that? Just last week, I found out. Zamp now has these pull pin. They're $60 for the set. And the reason they invented them was so that people could take them off to clean underneath them. We just installed our first ones. We had to order them. They do sell. I know. That's what I thought. But somebody wants it for some reason. Whatever's underneath that panel is okay under there. But no, just wipe them, hose them. Be careful, don't fall off the roof. But yeah, they... They have these new quick connect legs. So you can snap them, snap them, pull the panel off. The less you mess with it, the less chance you're going to break it. I just don't want somebody out in the audience going, you know, on TV audience going, oh, I'll tell him. Because we get those calls. Anything we say on here, people call in.
So to answer your question, if what I would say instead of bludgeoning you again, yeah. um, I would yeah. take my pressure washer and stand on a ladder and I would rinse off my roof, make sure that I don't get more than a foot away and you can shoot underneath it. And there's not going to be much under there. Nobody's going to live there. In the summertime, you could cook on one of these. They get extremely hot, so that's why they stand off. And they've got air going under there. And they get, I mean, you can, eggs and hash browns and no baby. They, they'll do, do a great job. Uh, Say but too loud, Ed will have a sound. Why does that water always out here? Feeding everybody in the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the other half of this is inverters. Uh, an inverter is different than the converter. Most coaches that you buy have a converter that takes 110, runs it through a transformer, makes 12 volt to charge batteries and operate your 12 volt system. The inverter is the exact opposite. It takes 12 volts from your batteries, runs it through the transformer and a high frequency switched circuit so it gives it an AC experience that it thinks is 60 cycles. And it steps up that current from 12 volt DC to 110 AC. Now, if you wanted to be able to operate your microwave off of your solar panels, then you have to have the inverter. And again, this is all very personal. Uh, the dealership that you work with that you trust, that there's people that really know what they're doing, I just tell people, sit down and talk to them, discuss your needs, and, and go from there. And I also stress that Al-Qaeda can do it for 2000 with Chinese stuff. We can do it for 2500 for good American stuff. Uh, I would, I'm, Eddie, you have that choice everywhere. And sometimes it's better to buy the better quality electronics, especially with inverters. Inverters are a very sophisticated piece of equipment. Uh, they make it so that you can operate your Aptia machine, your microwave, your toaster, your coffee pot, your TV, your computer, all of those 110 appliances without running the generator. And for a lot of us, that's a very important thing. And sometimes the parks don't want you running it all night, so if you're a night person or you have an Aptia machine, inverter and solar is the only choice. But these are amazing systems cost a little bit of money, but they can certainly free you up. Any questions on that before I go to my last couple little... Well, I'm really putting them to sleep. Um, how many of you are in the towed vehicle market, have a motorhome and tow a car? Are you interested in talking about uh, auxiliary braking systems? I'm sorry? Not in Oregon. You don't want to talk about it in Oregon? Not in Oregon. You don't need it in Oregon. Well, okay. You don't want to talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, the last thing is suspension things. Uh, anybody interested in suspension items on motorhomes? I think they wanted to talk about, you wanted to talk about towing, right? Or not? Oh. Yeah. You got yours all set up? Yep. Yeah. Do you ever leave Oregon? Okay. Well, you're safe, though. Yeah. If, if it just comes off, it's got a brake system on. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm basically done. I'm, it's, it's, if they're not interested, I mean, those are just the things on the list. Is there anything you do want to talk about? You want to talk about washer dryers or any uh, <laughs> stuff like that? way early so throw some at me i've been doing this long enough that there's, no, there's nothing's gonna throw me i've got a question no, the we, have a, we have a washer dryer never used it um french was <laughs> it, it was winterized by you guys when i go to get ready for the first week yeah. what do i need so the question is is they have a washer dryer that they never used. We winterized it. It's got antifreeze in it. So my question before I go to Dave is if you're not going to do use it, don't do anything to it because it just has 
little bit of antifreeze in it and leave it there. Okay. If you are going to use it, you got to run a cycle completely or two cycles completely okay, that, to get rid of it. That's all I have to do is run yeah. cycles. Yeah. Now, when, you, when you're operating your stack, Splendid, washer, dryer, uh, you have to be very careful about what kind of soap you use because they're very sensitive to foaming. Okay. Okay. That's the extent of my wisdom. You push the button. That's all I know. Slam the door. Some reason delete your socks. Have <laughs> you guys sold the soap here? I believe we do. Splendid. Again, it's you're at the end of my knowledge. All I know is is is, is I don't know what the difference well, I don't in the plan soap is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she wouldn't let me do the laundry. Smart lady. You can't get anywhere near that. Well, I'd like to introduce you to my wife. <laughs> Explain that to her, would you? <laughs> yeah, I'll ruin the clothes. <laughs> so that's what I did. My first year I was married to my wife, I burnt everything. Yeah, there you go. She finally just said, "You know, I can tell right now you're not a very good cook. I'll take that over." And I went, "My plan worked." Just a quick story. <laughs> I, I retired before my wife did, so I was going to clean the house. She was a manager. She's very diplomatic, and she looks at me and she says, "You know, Dean, house cleaning isn't one of your strengths. <laughs> Let's hire a house cleaner, and you do the things you're good at." <laughs> <laughs> at least she didn't fire me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to wrap it up then, if it, nobody else. Uh, if, there's um, a couple things that we want to talk about every time we get people together and their safety items. Years and years ago, we used to tell people if they smelled propane in their coach, don't turn any lights on or off because that creates a spark and an ignition point. But open your windows and go outside, leave your door open, close your screen door, and then go turn your propane off and, and sit back and watch your trailer. A few years ago, it, it, we became aware as an industry of the fact that some tests were done and propane sees a screen as a barrier. So if you have propane in your coach and you open the window and it's still got the screen on it to keep the bugs from coming in because they like the smell of propane, you leave the screen door closed, keep the cat in, so it doesn't, you know, it goes up with the ship. The problem is, is that the propane's going to settle on the floor and roll over to the screen door and sit there. It will not pass through the screen material. So now we tell people, if you are in your coach and you smell propane, make sure you're decently covered. Go outside, leave the door and the screen open, turn the propane off, don't touch anything else. Don't bother opening any windows. Just leave the door and the screen door open. Go around, turn your propane off. Go tell the neighbors to step back 10 feet, get their camera ready. Leave the coach, let it air out after you turn the propane off. Propane won't go through the screen material, so there's no sense in trying to air it out like that. Just leave the door open. The last thing I have is tires. One of the things that we make a lot of money on is body work. We just built a new body shop for <laughs> thanks to tires, basically. If you have a coach and you haven't used it in a couple of years, tires are sitting in one spot. I have a car that I just love, but I don't drive very often. And I get in and drive it, the first couple of miles, it's like thud, 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 until the tires soften up enough to get the flat spot out. So what happens in the RV industry, the tires may not be the best quality, and they've been sitting for a couple, three years, and they have a flat spot. And it's behind your pickup there, and you don't know it's going thud, 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 thud until it goes boom. And I have, <coughs> as a service writer, for several years, I don't know, <coughs> five, six, seven. Before that, I was a service manager for 20 years. We, I have seen this thousands of times. People have a nice fifth wheel, they hook it up, they haven't used it in two years, they're going to 
Yellowstone. This is back before Yellowstone was going to blow up. Anyway, you like that one? <laughs> okay. And they'd go about 100 miles and blow a tire. Get their spare off, put it on, go another 100 miles, blow a tire. 300 miles down the road, they've blown all the tires and knocked the whole sidewall off the driver's side. And the reason is, is the tires that sit, they get a flat spot, and the flat spot doesn't come out after a few years. And they're just going down the road, it's just... And you don't know that because you don't hear what's going on. Same thing with motorhomes, not quite as bad, but it's a big issue. If you, and you're worth, you're valuable, you're a loving person, you're worth a set of tires. So if you haven't used it for a couple of years, or you've had a setting in one spot, before you go to Yellowstone, put new tires on it, for our sake. But then we got to pay for our body shop, so <laughs> I don't know. Well, we, do, we do a lot of it in service, too. Yeah. That tire fills off and damages the sidewall. It's cut through the floor and gone through the bottom of the refrigerator and the cabinets. And yeah, we do a lot of very expensive tire blowouts. Pick. Okay. So the question is: Is do we have a rule of thumb uh, for the age of tires? The, the the other half of this last little conversation of mine, tires have a very specific lifetime. If, if we have a, right in the first bay here is a Dynamax, and it's a beautiful coach. Unfortunately, it hasn't been used much, and the Michelin tires are brand new. But we have to spend $6,000 on them because they're over seven years old. Manufacturers say seven to eight years. Our government, they're here to help. They say eight to nine years. So in our industry, we, Dave and I usually go around eight years. Seven to eight years, if, if your motorhome or your trailer, your utility trailer. Um, what if you store it inside? I'm sorry? What if you store your motorhome inside a building? The, the, the problem is, is there's, there's a load on the tire. Yeah, and there's a lot going on, especially in the sidewalls that you may not see. The tires look beautiful, but they have age and they're deteriorating. So regardless, you know, you, you can't tell the quality of... It, it, when you need to say I've, I've done everything I can to get me to six or seven years but now I'm gambling you can now depending on where you live when every time a jack leaves a cylinder it coats itself with the hydraulic oil but if you live on the coast and you're going to leave it even inside for six months on jacks eventually that salt air that's everywhere at the coast is going to get to those Cylinders. Even inside the building, you have salt in the air at the coast. I mean, it's yeah, but it will eat at your cylinders, and in cylinders being two to three thousand dollars a piece are more expensive than tires. So you can do all sorts of stuff to save on your tires. Don't buy tire covers; they make the tire too hot when the sun hits them. Put some piece of plywood up against it or something. It doesn't look as pretty in a park, but I've been seeing a lot of people now making nice ones out of plywood, and Grandma puts flowers on it or something, and way better than a cover. A cover just puts them in a sleeping bag, and then they cook. I see the ones with like a netting on it. Yeah, just something to block the sun. We have a King Air that's five years old up here that's set in a field uh, because he bought a road trek. They started using what they call their dinghy. They, had, they towed a road truck behind their 40-foot motorhome. They started using it, left the, road, the big motorhome set. The, the sidewall checking on his tires was so big that you could... We took quarters and stuck in the sides of the tires and sent him pictures. I mean, huge... You know, it's, sidewall checking's a huge issue. That's, 
water can get into the cords. Uh, so again, his bid was just a hair over six thousand dollars. So I just want to answer this. Um, yeah. Uh, one one comment here. Let's say that your coach is in really good shape. Your tires are nine years old. They're beautiful, and you say, you know, that's a lot of money. Let's just do one more trip. And you go to Texas, and halfway there, you're on your side in the ditch because you blow a tire. You seem like a nice lady. You're worth six thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. Um, it's so. Uh, my bottom line is is. Um, we draw the line at eight years, basically. It's up to you, but, you know, I'm, I'm not the kind of person, yeah, you keep those old tires. I don't like you. You know, it's, it, it's, it's just a really good safety thing. And so we, we draw the line at eight years, and salespeople know that, that, you know, they'd, someplace, oh, yeah, look, those are beautiful tires. They don't tell you they're nine years old. We put new tires on it. There is a date cut on every tire as well, so everybody can if you know if you know the code, you can go on a date. That's correct. Now don't, don't get me wrong. My little four by eight trash hauler trailer I've had for 20 years, yeah. I think probably still has the same tires when I bought it. <laughs> that if I'm heading to the dump and one of those goes bad, there's eh, not a lot going to happen. Probably finish driving it there with a flat tire and bring it home and throw another tire. But. <laughs> so anyway, that's my last attitude issue. Uh, now, unless you have anything else you want to talk about? Anything at all. Okay, fine. Government. Yes, government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, say, no. Conspiracies. Yeah. Yeah, see, I guess it's just you and I on that. Yeah, and yeah. My biggest Sorry. conspiracy is I've been tired that will last 50 years. They just don't. Everybody have a good one. Take them out and enjoy them. <laughs>